If you haven't been with us for the last couple weeks, we've been reimagining church. Like what, what church on the hill should be and could be. And so if you haven't been with us, you're joining us online, uh, let me run through it real quick. Here it is. We've reimagined what the mission and the values and the vision is for this church. The mission of Church on the Hill, displaying the irresistibility of Jesus so that lives are transformed. You saw some of that this morning in the baptismal uh, with Serena's story. The second, though, when we talk about our values, our number one value is this, is crowded heaven. We want to prioritize those people who are beyond our walls. I mean, it's not about us here. It's about those that are out there who don't yet know who Jesus is. Second value is tattered Bibles. We say we've been wearing out Bibles since 1850. And that's when this church was founded. Our third value is this. It's a rooted family. We talked about this last week, being fully known and fully loved. Now, as we go through these, these aren't just values that we say, oh, that's what Church on the Hill believes, because you're the church. You are church on the hill. If you call this church my church, so it begs this question, are these actually your personal values? In-N-Out Burger has values, right? But you can go there and order burgers, fries, and a shake, and you can participate, but that doesn't mean you actually own the values or believe in the values in and out You're just kind of consuming their goods, right? We're asking you this question. Instead of showing up to church to consume the goods, would you ask yourself the question, are these actually your personal values? And so here's where we're at. We're going to value number four today. And I will warn you that value number four is an oxymoron. It's two words that don't actually go together. And if you haven't spent a lot of time looking at oxymorons, let me just give you a couple. Ready? Working vacation. It doesn't go together, even though some of you try. Uh, civil war. It's not a thing. An exact estimate? Some of you have asked for that. Ready? Uh, Microsoft works? <laughs> Come on. And all the Apple people said, amen. amen. <laughs> so here's where we're at. Value number four is this. It's called tangible hope. Tangible hope. It shouldn't actually go together. Why? Tangible means this. It's something you can touch. It's something that you can taste, you can see it, you can hear it, you can experience it with your senses. Hope is this. It's the certainty of God's salvation in the future. It's the certainty not of just God's salvation in the future, but actually his presence with us today so that it gives us joy, endurance, peace, and reassurance right now. But you can't touch it, right? And you can't taste it. We can see the effects of it, but we can't actually see the hope. And so one of our values is this. It's called tangible hope. And I, I, I'm hoping that by the end of this message, it, it's not obscure to you. This actually becomes very, very tangible. See, for hope, if you already had what you hoped for, you wouldn't need hope. The very essence of using the word hope means that it's not quite here yet. Let me explain it in just uh, biblical terms. This might go over some people's head, but that's okay. We're going to jump into the deep end of the pool a little bit today. When the Bible talks about salvation, it talks about it three ways. Here's what it says. Christians, you are saved. You are today currently saved. But it also makes this statement. It says you are being saved. Well, how can I be being saved if I'm already saved? Well, that's how it describes it. And then it makes it even more confusing. There's a third way. It says Christians will be saved. So did you know this? Christians today, you are saved, you're being saved, and you will be saved. It talks about it and all that. Because when Jesus arrived, he showed up on the scene. He says, the kingdom of God, the presence of God is right here now with you. Because he was there. But yet the kingdom of God isn't completely here. We know we live in a world that is overrun with evil, but when we are saved, there will be a time that comes, a place where we're brought to that Jesus promised us in his Father's house in heaven where there is no more pain, there is no more war, there's no more violence, and there's no more sin. The struggle that we have here on earth will be over. So I just want you to know this, Christian, you are saved, and you're being saved, and you will be saved. Now, that clarified it all, didn't it? Of course it didn't. If it did, I'd be done preaching right now. I'm not done preaching, though. Here we go. Paul opens up this letter in 1 Thessalonians. Open your Bibles. 1 Thessalonians. 
he talks about this hope. And as I describe this hope, I'm hoping there's going to be an abundance of tangible clarity for you. Here's how he starts. Chapter 1, verse 3. And uh, because we believe in tattered Bibles, open it up, open up digital paper, doesn't matter. I don't know how you'll tatter that digital device, but whatever. Chapter 1, verse 3, he says this. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So this church that Paul wrote to in Thessalonica, they worked hard, they labored and they worked, and they endured a lot of conflict from people outside their church. Their work and endurance, though, it actually came from their faith in Jesus, what he did on the cross for them and his, re and his resurrection. The labor was driven by their love for God and their love for people. And their ability to endure the suffering came from their hope that there was something good for them in the future, salvation in heaven. Now, that was a lot of theological terminology. Let me simplify it for you. Um, I've told this story before in a memorial service. I, I occasionally draw this story out during memorial services. I don't know if I've ever told this story here in church, though. Uh, but if you like this story, let me know, and I'll tell it at your memorial service, too. There is a woman who was diagnosed with a terminal disease, and the doctor told her, you need to get your affairs in order. So she went to her pastor. And she said, I, I want to plan my memorial service. And first of all, we're not going to call it a memorial service. It's going to be a celebration of life. So she helped pick the songs to her service. She picked uh, the scripture that was going to be read, the photos that would be printed, and the photos on the screen. She even picked the flowers. And she, she picked this dress. She said, we're going to have an open casket service. She said, I, I want to wear this blue dress with white polka dots. It's my favorite. So Dress me up in that. If you've ever been to an open casket service, you know, you know how it works. It's usually right down in front, and they pop the lid of that casket, and she's right there, or at least her body's right there. And the pastor said, okay, I, I can do all these things. And on her way out of the office, she said to him, oh, but, but by the way, there's one more thing. When you bury me, I want to make sure that you bury me with a fork in my right hand. Pastor's like, I'm willing to do a lot of accommodations for anyone's memorial service, but you got to tell me, like, why the fork in your right hand? She said, you know, uh, people are going to pass by that casket. They're going to look and pay their respects, and they're going to ask about the fork. And she said, Pastor, I know you're confused about this, but let me explain. When I was a little girl, I just grew up going to church. And some of you will recognize this, like, back in old school church, they did potlucks, Right? Anybody been to a church potluck, right? Everybody brings something. Somebody brings fried chicken. And it's like, man, it's just good. You get this fried chicken, you get homemade biscuits sometimes. You, you get all kinds of food. And she's like, I even like the weird jello that some people brought, right? Because it ain't church unless someone's bringing a weird jello dessert in the old school days. But then when the meal started closing, they would come by, and the people who were serving, they'd start to clear your plates. But the older people around me, they'd been to so many potlucks, they knew what was coming, and they'd lean over, and they whispered to me, make sure you keep your fork. She said, at that point, I knew what was coming. Because the, the chicken and the biscuits, they were all done, but what was coming out next was chocolate cake, apple pie, and I held on to my fork. Because I knew at the very end, man, there were good things in store at the end. She said, when people pass by my casket and they ask about the fork, I want you to tell them that I was a believer and the basis of the Christian faith is this, the best things are yet to come. She knew at the end of that meal there was something waiting for her that was fantastic. And that is actually what our hope in Jesus is about. That the best things in life are not in this life. That the best things are yet to come. So if you're looking at your notes, let me describe Christian hope, our tangible hope, this way. Christian hope is anticipating that the best is yet to come in salvation and in heaven. That is our hope, and we hope for it because we don't yet have it. Our hope is in the words that Jesus spoke in John 14. In my Father's house has many rooms, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Now, go back to 1 Thessalonians. Go to chapter 5 and take a look at verse 8. 
He begins his letter with hope and he ends it with hope. He says this, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate. And then here it is. And the hope of salvation as a helmet. It's kind of weird. I want you to take hope. This hope of salvation, this, this hope of a day that you'll be with Jesus forever in heaven, and I want you to put it on. What does a helmet do? It protects your mind, right? Protects your noggin. Why? Because we live in a world that is absolutely consumed. And when I say we live in a world, I don't mean like everybody else. Come on, this is us. We are distracted by our comfort. We're distracted by the most immediate needs in front of us today. And I think what Paul is saying is, I don't want you to lose focus. Don't be distracted. Put the hope of salvation on to protect your thinking. Because what he's going to call us to, and Paul lived this out, he made all kinds of sacrifices. That guy was beaten, jailed, whipped, tortured, because he wouldn't stop talking about Jesus, because he put on the the helmet of the hope of salvation. And it wasn't just for him, it was for other people. Um, let me show you another place in 1 Thessalonians where Paul spoke of this hope of heaven. Go to chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, verse 19. He says this, For what is our hope? Our joy or the crown in which we will glory, future, which when we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So he's writing this church. He's like, listen, we led you to Jesus. We told you about him. You accepted him. You were baptized into Jesus. And because of that, you're the thing that when we get to heaven, we're going to celebrate. You're our crown. You're our joy. You're our, you're our hope. See, number two is that Christian hope is actually helping other people arrive in heaven. I, I know points one and two kind of sound the same, but first of all, the question number one is, do you have this hope that you're going to be in heaven with Jesus? And the second is, do we live our lives in such a way that we're actually helping other people arrive in heaven? Here's what I love about this. I just read to you the last two verses of chapter two, and it's this statement about why it is they, they feel so strongly. For you're our hope. We love you. You're our crown. We glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. I mean, it's you. We're so excited about you. But then look at how it gets super, super practical in chapter three. Now, when he wrote this, he didn't write chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. There's no designations. So this statement directly follows chapter 2, and it's connected. Listen to this. So when we could stand it no longer, chapter 3, verse 1. I want you to think Popeye. How many of you grew up watching Popeye? Yeah? You're old. <laughs> Do you remember Popeye? He'd get in this fight, and he'd kind of be getting the tar kicked out of him. And at one point, he'd make this statement. That's all I can stands and I can't stands no more. I, 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 right? Or something like that. Sorry, that sounded like Woody Woodpecker or something. So when we could stand it no longer, we couldn't tolerate it. Here it is. We thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who's our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. Now listen, you got to know context here. If we went back to Acts chapter 17, you'd hear the story about how Paul, Silas, Timothy, they all visit this city, but you know that it took three weeks and this, um, this riot erupts in town. This church faces violence, legal trials, persecution. The, the, there were people in the town trying to shut them down. So much so that... It states that Paul and Silas, under the cover of darkness at night, had to flee the town because of these riots. Paul was so concerned. The thing he couldn't stand was, I just don't know how you're doing. I don't know if you're surviving the bullying in town. And so he, he decides, you know, I can't go there. And we don't know exactly why Paul couldn't go there. Whether God was like, no, you can't go, or whether they were so looking for Paul, waiting for him to, to throw him in jail. But he said, we couldn't stand it any longer, so we had to show up. And if it couldn't be me, I'm sending Timothy your way. Why? 
because I was concerned that this church might fail. And the church is people. He's concerned that their faith might fail, that they might give up hoping for the return of Jesus. They might give up on their relationship with him. Which brings us to the third point of Christian hope. Christian hope means showing up in tangible ways during hardship. To give people tangible hope of Jesus, listen, we got to show up into their mess. Let me explain it this way. On January 13th, 1982, Washington, D.C. was buried in a couple feet of snow. But Air Florida Flight 90 attempted their takeoff. They de-iced their wings, but the ice on the wings impeded their lift, and they actually crashed into the 14th Street Bridge. And then the, the airplane broke apart and landed into the Potomac River, but there was so much snow that this river was half iced over. And on that day, 74 people perished. But to everybody's surprise, there were six people still alive. The problem was they were floating in the middle of the Potomac River, and there was ice all around, and they knew this. EMS, emergency services, there, there was no way they were going to be there quickly. The roads were jammed in feet of snow. Traffic was bad. It was going to be a while before they got there. So driving home from work that day was a sheet metal worker. His name, Roger Olian. This is his picture. He knew the traffic and snow was going to hinder the services for them to get rescue. Emergency crews were not going to be there soon. These people in the middle of the river were going to die if somebody didn't rescue them. He pulls over his truck goes to the edge of the river, ties a rope around his waist, hands the end of the rope to people standing there on the shore, and he jumped into the half-frozen river. As he swam across, he, he got to these ice floats, and he couldn't swim around there, so he half-crawled over top of these. At some point, he just realized he could not make it to these people because of the ice, because of uh, the, the cold in the water, but he refused to leave. He refused to have people pull him to safety. His voice could be heard by those six people. And he said, I'm not leaving. Don't worry, help's on the way. And all he did was speak words of hope and words of encouragement to them. Roger Olian was in that bone-chilling water for 20 minutes, unwilling to leave, just speaking words of encouragement for people to hang on. On that day, Five of the six people who survived were pulled to safety. And they later on, after reflecting on this, they, stole, they, they told the story of the impact of Roger being in the water that day. They said he didn't have anything tangible to offer them for their rescue. This is their words written in this news report. He didn't have anything tangible to offer them for their rescue other than his presence that he was with them, and that kept them alive with his words of hope. See, I think if we hold the value of tangible hope, this hope in Jesus, that when people get in a mess, we jump in with them. I think we jump in the river to help, even it comes at a great sacrifice. See, that story's not over, though, because there was another guy in the water that day his name was Arland Williams. He was one of the passengers in the flight who survived the crash. And when the helicopters actually showed up, they noticed that he was the most responding. Uh, he was the most alert. And so the helicopters, when they finally made it, they started lowering these rescue ropes to pull victim to safety. But when the rope came to Arland, he kept passing it off to other people. I'm good. You take it. Another rope comes, I'm good, you take it. The fifth person was pulled from the water, dragged to safety. The helicopter returned with the next rope. But in the meantime, the tail end of that plane, plane sank, pulling Arlen Williams under. And he died that day. He died that day because he said, I'm good, you take it. I want to offer you help and I want to offer you hope. He perished that day helping other people. 
The 14th Street Bridge is now known as the Arlen Williams Bridge. See, Arlen, he didn't have to jump in the water. He just found himself in the mess. Roger Olean, it wasn't even his mess. He could have just been a by bystander, but he jumped in the mess to be with people. In church, around this world, with your family, with your coworkers, with your neighbors, with your friends, you're going to find yourself in a mess. And you have the opportunity to offer people tangible hope. There's going to be other moments where the mess is not yours. I mean, you might not belong to the company that's going under, and you're going you're gonna to jump in that mess with them. There's moments where, like, man, you're just going to find yourself like, ah, I'm, I'm in a medical emergency mess right now, and it, you're in it. But there's other moments where you're on the outside looking in. Someone's marriage is sinking. And instead of watching it, you jump in the mess with them to offer tangible hope. Here's that point. Christian hope is showing up in tangible ways during hardship. Y'all with me? By the way, uh, you got invited to do that today. It, it's a small way, but I think it's a pretty important way. Uh, Efren is one of our missionaries, church partners down in Tijuana. And uh, he's running churches down there. He has so many people that are kind of gathering. They had to build a bigger um, a facility to house these kids and these families. And your part in it is this. You get to buy the most expensive tamale of your life today. <laughs> you should take a picture and post it on Facebook and be like, you'll have no idea how much this tamale costs. And then just put the price there. This tamale cost me $1,000. <laughs> I'm priming the pump, aren't I? Come on. I'm, I'm not going to prime the pump too hard here, right? The point is, though, that we got to offer hope in tangible ways. We, we don't bring people to Christ in Tijuana. God does. We're not there every week. Ephraim is. But we can offer hope and encouragement in tangible ways. We're going to fund what they're building. We're going to fund the fun that they're going to have in a couple weeks. There's a group of you that are going down there. You're going to offer tangible hope by your presence being there and offering words of encouragement, a hug to kids, games, a story about Jesus. This is what tangible hope is. Now, I'm going to switch gears with you before I end right here. I have a double meaning for tangible hope, and it's this. Tangible hope is the hope that we offer people that's in Jesus. But how do you know it's true? How do you know Jesus is the Savior of the world? How do you know that there's a heaven waiting for us? See, number four is this. Christian hope is based on the tangible events of the death and the resurrection of Christ. Now, our hope is not just hope. Like, you don't go, oh, I just hope it's true. I hope the Bible's right. I mean, I, I hope that Jesus is really the Son of God, because that's foolish. That's just stupid. Our hope is actually based on something that is tangible, that people touched, that people saw, that they smelt, that they experienced. I'm going to take you. Uh, turn with me real quick. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just my personal opinion, I think it actually might be the most important scripture in all of the Bible. It says this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. So here's the good news about Jesus, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. So this is pretty critical. How do you know you're saved? This good news, this is how you know you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. Here it is, verse 3, chapter 15. For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance. What does that mean? There's nothing else more important than these words right here. Here he goes. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter, your, your Bible might say Cephas, same person, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. 
most of whom are still li living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me. Paul gives us tangible evidence. He's like, this is the most important thing. We believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And he says, there were plenty of people there to watch it and witness it. We saw him die. Joseph of Arimathea took his body off the cross, buried him in a tomb. And then three days later, he wasn't there. And you're like, wow, he wasn't there. Is that the end of the story? No, Paul says this. Here's the greatest tangible evidence that we saw, that we touched, that we smelt, that we experienced. Jesus showed himself to the 12. He appeared and they talked to him. You're like, well, maybe it's just this big hoax in history. But the problem is that his followers, those 12, they were actually murdered because they wouldn't deny that Jesus came back to life and they saw him and touched him. And then he says this, he says, 500 people at one time, Jesus showed up and he's like, what's up? Okay, he didn't say that. But there's a couple hundred people in this room right now. Could you imagine what it would take for a couple hundred of you to have the same delusional moment that that was Jesus? Take away all the technology that we have today. It's not this like image thing that's being produced. I mean, it... It's the physical Jesus that you touched. He said 500 people saw him, talked to him. He was with them at one time. It's either the greatest mass delusion in the history of the world, or it's true, Jesus came back to life. Your faith isn't based on someone telling you a story. It's based on the tangible historical evidence that Jesus came back to life. That's our hope. That's why I think this chapter is one of the most important chapters in all of the Bible. Now, if we go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, um, Ellie, I'm going to go a little out of order here, but that's okay. Chapter 4, verse 13. Here's what he writes. He says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Such a great statement. Two kinds of people in this world. There's those who grieve with hope and there's those who grieve without hope. Those who grieve without hope, they just don't know where they're going when they die. They don't know what happened to that person when they died. Those who grieve with hope go, hey, listen, I may have suffered, I may have died, or maybe I died too early, but when you look at someone's death like that and you know they're a follower of Jesus, you know that your faith is based off the fact that the best is yet to come, that heaven is in store for them. And that when you grieve, you grieve with the hope that whatever sacrifices you make today so that other people can discover who Jesus is, their life can be transformed, you make that sacrifice knowing that the best is yet to come. He goes on, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep with him. Um, that's a, a shortened version of what he explained in 1 Corinthians 15. I think Paul gives us tangible evidence of the death and resurrection of Jesus. So if you go back to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15, here's how he ends. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, notice who he's writing to, all you who are listening is still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who've fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words." He's speaking about a day that hasn't happened yet. There's a day that is coming in the future where Jesus will return visibly from heaven, coming through the clouds. We will, those who are his, who are believers, true believers, who believe in Jesus' death for their sins, who believe in his resurrection, who have a relationship with him, who've been adopted into his family, will rise in the air and meet him on that day. 
and they will be with the Lord forever in heaven in a perfect place with no more tragedy or pain. And Paul's just saying, don't live like this isn't going to happen. And truth is, there's a lot of people who believe that this day is very, very, very close. He just says this, don't give up hope. Not only do I not want you to give up hope, but I want you to keep offering hope to other people. Here's how I would say this as I summarize this. Tangible hope, this oxymoronic value of ours. The longer version, I would say it this way. For people to discover the tangible historical hope in Jesus. For people to discover this tangible this historical hope in Jesus. We need to love them in tangible, practical ways. Now, as a value, that's super hard to remember, and you're probably not going to remember all of it, so let me shorten it for you. Tangible hope is this. It's just loving people in practical ways. If we hold this value, that our faith is not only tangible, we have this tangible hope, we need to offer it in tangible, practical ways. Which means this. When you see somebody's life in a mess, jump in a river with them. Don't stand off and hoping that somebody else will offer them help and hope and encouragement. It might come at great cost to you. Financial cost, emotional cost. Because can I be honest? I've jumped in the river with plenty of people. To say, let me jump in your mess with you. Some of those were messes that they inflicted on themselves. Some of those were messes that someone else inflicted, or, or sometimes it's just a medical report, right? That you're like, I don't know how this happened. But can I tell you that sometimes when you jump in the mess with them, it doesn't always turn out well. Messes that they've created, sometimes they said, well, don't, don't be judgmental at me. Don't tell me I did something wrong. I'm like, I'm, I'm here to encourage you. It doesn't always turn out like we thought or we hoped. And not every person that I've ever offered hope and help to has received it well or turned to Jesus. But you know what? You just watch Serena get baptized. It's stories like that that we just go, it's worth it. It's worth it because you don't know. Your, your job isn't to convert somebody. You know that? Your job is to be a person of hope in a tangible way. Love them and speak the truth about who Jesus is. Their response, God dictates who's saved. He will grab them and he will rescue them. He will bring conviction into your life. Our job is to be in the river with them. You with me? That's why we value this thing called tangible hope. So we're going to pray, and, uh, but I have two questions for you as we go to prayer. Let me have a band come out and they're going to lead us in a final worship song. Um, first question is this. Have you actually put your hope in Jesus? Are you a Christian? I've presented some historical evidence that he really was the son of God who died on the cross and was resurrected back to life and appeared to hundreds of people. But do you believe his death paid for your sins? That he died on the cross so that you could be forgiven and adopted into his family? If you have not said yes to that, maybe today's the day that you're about to do that. As we pray, you just tell God that. God, yeah, I've messed up. I've sinned. I've broken all kinds of my own values, much less your values, God. And sin, so that, so that heaven remains perfect, so that, that heaven is that place of peace and no longer tra a tragic place, sin can't enter heaven, which means if we're full of it, we can't go. Someone has to pay for it. So my question to you is, have you put your hope in Jesus? If you want to today, pray that as we pray. My second question is this, if you are a Christian, are you offering tangible hope to people? Who are the people in your circle who don't yet know Jesus and maybe their life is in a mess? Can I just tell you the beauty of a mess? When someone's in a mess, they're super willing to get saved by something or hear words of hope. Can you imagine people in the river that day? No, I'm good. I don't need anybody to help me. But people in a mess, when you say, you know what? Um, can we talk about that? Can I offer you some hope based off of a person I know, and his name is Jesus? Who are you loving in practical ways? Give God a chance to speak to you this morning about who he wants you to offer hope to and maybe how you can do that. Are you with me? The two questions. Have you already put your hope in Jesus? 
And would you just listen? The second question is, would you just listen for God's voice? Who is he wanting you to speak to in love and practical ways? Can we bow our heads? Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you that our, our faith is not just this blind faith that we're just hoping in a book. But God, that you showed up so that we would know that you're the Savior of the world. And God, I bet there's some, um, some people's hearts here today that, that they're struggling. Do I pray to receive Jesus? I pray that you would give them the courage to cross that line of faith right now. And Lord, I pray that our ears would be tuned so that you would speak to us today about who you want us to offer tangible hope to, that we might be a part of their story, be willing to step in their mess. So God, our ears are open. And I would pray, God, that we would keep hearing stories of people coming to know you. And I'm looking forward to hearing stories from Mexico about what it is you're going to do down there because of that team going. God, use us to transform people's lives. And if you agree with that, would you say amen?